My name is Quinn Meekham. Uh, I'm a, a professor of political science and, and the coordinator of the Middle East Studies uh, program here at Brigham Young University. Uh, this is the second in a series of lectures that uh, we hope will continue for some time uh, between uh, Brigham Young University and the University of Utah. Uh, where we are uh, learning from one another and from the expertise that uh, the faculty in these two institutions bring uh, to the study of the Middle East um, and Middle Eastern history, politics, and religion. Uh, it's my great uh, privilege to welcome to BYU today uh, Peter Von Sivers, who is an associate professor of history at the University of Utah. Uh, Professor Von Sivers uh, is an expert in classical Islamic history, in medieval and early modern Spain, in medieval and modern North Africa, in Islamic philosophy and science. Um, he's widely published in the fields of world history. Um, he uh, has a number of, of, of book chapters and articles on topics such as Christology and Prophetology in the Early Umayyad Arab Empire, uh, the Rise of Balkan Nationalism Within the Triangle of the Ottoman, Austrian, and Russian Empires, 1800 to 1878, um, and has been quite involved in a number of questions uh, regarding the early Islamic period, which we get to hear about today. Um, his topic uh, is on Islamic origins, uh, specifically thinking about uh, the religious debates that were taking place in the Middle East around the, the rise of Islam and the, the role of those debates uh, in the development of the Islamic community in its, its earliest stages. Uh, Islamic origins, for those of you who are, are not familiar, Islamic origins has become an interesting uh, public and scholarly debate in, in recent years, uh, trying to understand uh, the remarkable success of this world religion and where it came from. Uh, what were the influences in early Islamic thought? And Professor Von Sivers today is going to be uh, discussing some early work from a book manuscript that he is currently writing uh, on those Islamic origins. So please join me in welcoming Professor Von Sivers to BYU. Uh, thank you, Quinn, for this very generous introduction uh, that you have uh, given. And uh, I'm very happy to be uh, talking to you uh, and uh, uh, talking also to uh, many of you who probably don't have much of a background on uh, Islamic uh, studies. But you will see then in the course of the talk uh, that uh, quite a few things that I uh, will be talking about are very relevant also for the uh, contemporary understanding. And uh, particularly in the conclusion, I will uh, address a few of these works. Uh, I'm giving you a short outline, and then I will repeat this uh, outline as I'm going along, uh, so that you have a basic idea here that this will probably sound, uh, look a bit intimidating, uh, but I am really uh, focusing on only one uh, point uh, that I am pursuing in this uh, book on which I'm working, and uh, uh, that is concerned with trithism, uh, which uh, um, uh, looms uh, quite large in the, uh, uh, in the Quran and in the debates of uh, the uh, 6th and uh, early 7th centuries. So that's the, uh, uh, um, a quick overview. And let me begin now. Um, uh, Professor Meekham briefly alluded to this already. Uh, Islamic origins have become very important in uh, the last, uh, well, th sort of 50 years. Um, or maybe uh, uh, even shorter than that, uh, because um, uh, the research that has been carried out on these Islamic origins is quite different from the traditional approach that was taken ever since the 19th century. In the 19th century, of course, with the beginning of academic research of Judaism and Christianity, uh, was um, uh, a, a period where uh, scholars, uh, usually uh, secular in background, uh, we're looking at the origins of uh, th uh, th uh, the religions of um, uh, Judaism, uh, Christianity, and uh, eventually also Islam. Now, in uh, the case of Islam, this has been hampered for quite a bit uh, because uh, the, uh, and even that is uh, well known, of course, and also admitted by Muslims themselves, uh, the Islamic sources uh, date in general to 200 years after the first appearance of uh, uh, what we then later called Islam. Uh, 
So that means uh, that these sources are uh, um, have uh, um, or were written with a delay uh, uh, of a, a considerable uh, amount of time, uh, which meant then that uh, all kinds of religious points of view, also various kinds of tribal competitions, tribal boosting, and the like. Um, were part of this um, Islamic tradition as it uh, developed in uh, 200 years later. And we do not have really a good access to the uh, original uh, documents or uh, um, the events uh, that we would be looking uh, at through the, these documents going back 200 years earlier. So uh, Orientalism, which is then the field that uh, engaged in the research on Islamic origins, uh, operated then according to the theory of, um, as I call it here, the onion peel theory, meaning you peel away layer after layer so that eventually you arrive at the historical kernel. Uh, that uh, dominated the field until about uh, 1980 uh, and uh, ended unfortunately now in retrospect in a disaster because uh, uh, you peeled and peeled and peeled and as we know, onions don't have kernels and so there was nothing once you have taken, had taken away all of the peels. This, that means <coughs> there was a considerable crisis in uh, Islamic studies, uh, which were accompanied also by an enormous amount of uh, polemics, uh, people disputing each other, disputing each other's uh, ability and the like, which uh, has taken place. We are just barely coming out of this. Um, I've been always trying to uh, uh, avoid uh, these kinds of controversy because, of course, they lead to nothing uh, and do not help in the, in the actual research. But it's still going on, particularly in Europe, um, uh, in Germany and in uh, France and um, in England. Uh, there are vicious uh, reviews of scholars of each other. So uh, uh, it's a minefield. It's a minefield, of course, also because uh, um, what is happening in the Middle East right now is, of course, a resurgence of what one can call Islamic reformism, in other words, a form of Islam that uh, uh, was uh, dominant maybe in the 900s, 1000s, 1100s, but um, uh, not thereafter. And uh, this kind of um, reform uh, Islam uh, emphasizes very strongly the historicity of, this, uh, of um, uh, the events of 600, even though they are uh, doubtful in, uh, in their actual um, uh, occurrence. So um, what scholars who have been now working during, during the last 50 years on uh, Islamic origins are um, uh, uh, working with is the assumption of uh, a context in which uh, Muslims appeared in uh, the course of the 600s and uh, this contextualism approach is the one that I'm also embracing. So my own uh, project uh, is involved with the sources that were contemporary to the rise of Islam in the 600s, which are mostly Christian in nature. Now, the interesting phenomenon exists also that the Quran itself, so the holy scripture of the Muslims, uh, can be dated actually to the 600s, and uh, recent uh, uh, carbon dating of uh, some of these early manuscripts uh, has even uh, revealed the possibility that uh, the Quran might have existed before the Quran, so 580. <laughs> Uh, instead of um, the 620s, etc. Now, uh, that, with that um, as a background, I would like to uh, begin with, um, uh, this is now contextualism, uh, the approach that uh, we can understand the rise of Islam only if we really have a good understanding of what happened among the, uh, or within the Christian denominations of the 500s. And we are talking there about vicious uh, <coughs> um, uh, attacks of Christians uh, against each other. Uh, the 500s weren't maybe quite as bad as the, as the 400s, but they were still pretty bad. And you can see this in this particular title that I included by uh, Philip Jenkins. A uh, lengthy title, but uh, is, uh, I think a very descriptive one. And uh, I recommend this book very much uh, to you so that you have an idea here of what really went on before Christianity became what it actually was with lots of assassinations, street riots, uh, people being uh, uh, deposed from their bishoprics and so on. So um, with that uh, in, in the background, we need to understand that two councils, uh, Chalcedon 541 uh, and the Fifth Ecumenical Council of Constantinople 553, uh, essentially set uh, Christianity into uh, 
uh, its path, which then uh, was also important for the 600s when uh, Islam emerged. And uh, uh, we are talking there about, the um, uh, first of all, the uh, Chalcedonian Creed, which uh, then became cons uh, constituent of um, uh, the Christian um, uh, denominations, uh, first uh, what we call Eastern Christianity, but then also Catholicism and, of course, eventually Protestantism. And that does not play a major part, certainly not in my talk, and also uh, in historically in the evolution of um, uh, early Islam. So I'm not commenting much on this. But I, I will be commenting on two churches that were considered from the point of view of Chalcedon. So in other words, from the Byzantine emperor, that determined that the Chalcedonian Creed, which of course is basic for um, all Christian churches, uh, that that creed should be uh, the, the orthodox one. Um, so these two churches departed from it and were described therefore as heresies. Now, um, as a good historical scholar uh, who, who does not have any uh, religious axe to grind, for me these are not heresies, these are just other expressions of Christianity. So I therefore, I'm talking about Nestorianism, one of the, uh, the uh, forms of Christianity uh, that um, uh, existed at this time and was driven out of the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire into the Persian Empire that was a great competitor during the 500s with uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, they were driven out because they allegedly preached uh, two persons in the one um, uh, Jesus Christ, and uh, how can that be uh, Christianity if you have uh, a, a full humanity and a full divinity in this one person? I will come back to this particular question. Uh, but that was then uh, the reason why uh, the, uh, and there were of course then political machinations that uh, accompanied this uh, process of driving the Nestorians out. They reconstituted themselves in the Persian Empire where they formed a Christian minority because of course the Persians were um, uh, of a completely different background, uh, Zoroastrian, uh, which is not of interest uh, uh, for our purpose here. Uh, the other main Christian church at that time was up and coming and was actually uh, fighting uh, the, uh, the, the main church, the imperially represented, uh, um, represented church, mightily with uh, all means, I mean with all of the means that Jenkins also discuss, discusses here about uh, mutual um, uh, calumnations and so, and so on. Uh, the, uh, the, this other church uh, was that of the Monophysites in Egypt, and um, they had a special name as far as Syria was concerned, where they were called the Jacobites. Now, the founding father of the Monophysites in general, including then also the Jacobites in Syria, was Severus of Antioch. He was a um, um, uh, bishop for a short time, then he was de deposed by the imperial church, and then uh, he was determined to establish a separate monophysite uh, church hierarchy with um, uh, the establishment of bishoprics, uh, particularly in Syria, so um, uh, uh, I will show you on a map then um, a little further on uh, where exactly. And, he, uh, and then after his death, um, uh, two uh, people particularly were, in, uh, were appointed uh, to see to it that uh, this church was well represented in Syria in competition with the Roman, uh, Eastern Roman uh, Chalcedonian church. And so you have various places in Syria where you have double hierarchies uh, competing with each other and of course fighting for uh, the, the believers in the various towns uh, where, they uh, where they were represented. So uh, I'm referring here to Theodore um, uh, and uh, Jacob Baradeus, who were appointed as bishops, and uh, who then, uh, and that's now the important point, uh, became active among the Arabs. And uh, uh, as they uh, unfolded their activity in uh, the period uh, after their appointment, so um, uh, 544, so in the 550s, 60s, 70s, when they uh, converted um, many uh, um, uh, uh, imperial Chalcedonian uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Christians to monophysitism uh, in Syria. Uh, they um, uh, penetrated actually then also into Arabia and uh, quite a few then became monophysites rather than Chalcedonian Christians. So they converted from Chalcedonian Christianity to, to, um, uh, to um, uh, monophysitism, to Jacobism. Uh, very important point here because we are not talking about any Arab pagans. Uh, 
Now, um, however, as this process of the formation of the monophysitic church in Syria took place, there, were, um, there was a, a split within the, quote, heresy of the monophysites or Jacobites, um, and that was uh, the heresy of John Philoponos, who formulated this tritheist, quote, heresy. Now here I have to be a little technical, so I hope you can all follow me uh, with, the, uh, with, with the thought process that defines now this tritheism for which John Philoponos uh, was important. Um, uh, John is actually much better known as a great philosopher in uh, uh, the Alexandri Alexandrian um, uh, uh, tradition. Uh, we know a lot about his uh, criticism about Aristotle, and so um, uh, he played a major part then later in the Middle Ages. But he was also a great, uh, an important theologian, and he developed the following basic definition of uh, 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 Trinity, which contradicts that of uh, Chalcedonian, uh, Chalcedon, and that is, of course, um, uh, there is God the Father, uh, Jesus the Son and the Spirit that proceeds either from the Father and the Son or from the Father alone. That's, of course, um, a further uh, a division than uh, within Christianity. So this idea here of Father, Son, and Spirit, um, all representing manifestations or individuality, so to speak, of, uh, of the divinity, uh, was rejected by Philoponus, and he instead proposed that each of the Trinity is its own God. So there's God the Father, uh, Jesus the Son, but he is uh, an, a God by himself. And then the Spirit, uh, whom John calls a comforter, uh, that is another, not, a, not exactly person, but certainly another entity, so to speak. Why was that possible, that uh, such a redefinition of Trinity that contradicts actually the Nicene Creed, um, which I briefly um, uh, Im implied um, a few moments ago, um, why was it possibly that, that John did so? And that is um, by uh, Philoponus' time, so we are talking about the second half of the 500s, the Aristotelian philosophy in which John was uh, steeped very deeply uh, is uh, quite ambiguous as to what a substance is. And so um, Aristotle actually says um, substance is uh, really a primary substance. So. Uh, Every one of us who is sitting here is a substance to him, uh, to herself or himself, and uh, that uh, therefore then uh, the nature uh, today we would say the character or the character traits um, are personal to each of us or to each of, of the substances that we represent. Uh, that is certainly possible in an Aristotelian uh, interpretation. But it would mean that what unites us, so all of us uh, can be considered um, uh, members or individuals of humanity. So we represent each individually uh, what we can call the secondary substance of humanity. So in other words, humanness is what is, what is represented in all of us. But there you see now a contradiction in Aristotle. Um, we could be interpreted either as being each of us a substance with our personal characteristics and traits, which we would then call nature, or we could say we are all members of human humanity and are individuations of this humanity, but um, uh, as individuations, we are not persons. We then still need, in addition, to be called whatever our names are, with our personal characteristics and the like. So this double definition of what nature is plagues the entire 500s and is actually, in terms of uh, theological thought, the background for all of these quarrels and, and, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, differences among the Christians. In any event, uh, the, the point that uh, uh, Philoponus had, uh, made was in Trinity, each of the three figures represents their own substance, and so therefore, what unites them is really only in name. So in other words, yes, there's God the Father, there's uh, Jesus the Son, and there's the Spirit. And then, sort of an, in an abstract sense, they have the common nature of, quote, divinity. 
But divinity doesn't really exist. It's only a figment of our imagination. Uh, it's, uh, that Aristotle says is actually quite um, uh, explicitly, explicitly in, in, in the anima. So therefore, um, they're only sort of vaguely in one's mind, but not in reality, uh, united through the term trinity, but they are really all apart from each other. That now was the heresy of tritheism that became rampant in Syria, and I mentioned here on the bottom, this is just in passing that I want to mention this, um, the monks in uh, uh, Syria were now deeply split, so the Jacobite monophysites were deeply split between regular monophysitism, which was one of the so-called heresies, uh, and which relies on the, uh, actually on, uh, the, on a particular definition of what uh, the nature of Jesus is. I will not go into this, it's not necessary for our purposes here. And then there were lots of monks in the same monasteries, because monasteries dotted the landscape of Syria, uh, who professed this um, uh, tritheism. So uh, because of this split, and probably there were furious discussions among these monks, uh, are the members of Trinity substances, or are the members of uh, Trinity just manifestations or aspects, so to speak? Uh, Furious discussions, we can assume, in these, uh, uh, in these um, uh, monasteries. And so the Archimandrites, as uh, the documents uh, refer to, they were actually the abbots of these monasteries, were very concerned about these splits among their, uh, their monks in these monasteries. And they wrote uh, to their respective bishops, uh, help us, uh, what can we do in all of this? And uh, um, we unfortunately don't know the answer, but uh, uh, that was, must have been a situation of high anxiety toward the end of the 700s. And so um, uh, uh, given this particular situation, there was on top of that also then a schism in the uh, Jacobite or Monophysite church hierarchy with uh, one of the bishops, Damien of Alexandria, uh, whom, uh, who was accused by his opponent, uh, Peter of Kalinicum. Kalinicum, by the way, is, uh, the, uh, was at that time the name for Raqqa. That, of course, is the uh, eastern Syrian city that was recently reconquered from ISIS, if you want to locate this um, geographically. I will show you a map in a moment. Uh, so they accused each other, these two bishops, of uh, uh, horrible heresies, uh, Sabellianism, uh, which is a uh, much earlier... Um, uh, uh, heresy in, in uh, uh, the uh, late 200s, early 300s, according to which uh, uh, Jesus was not divine, but merely a, uh, an adopted um, uh, 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 figure of uh, high spiritual standing. So he was accused of, of that particular heresy. And then the important point, Peter of Kalinigum was accused of tritheism. De facto, he was not a, tr a tritheist, but that's not important. Uh, tritheism continued right into the early 600s when finally then the schism was ended, and tritheism then probably faded from the scene, but not quite, and that's the whole point of uh, my departure then for Islamic origins, because, um, uh, let me see the, uh, yeah, one more point, briefly, because this, um, uh, this uh, conflict between regular Jacobites, so the monophysite so-called heresy, and then the split within the Jacobites um, uh, represented by this tritheus, that uh, then was visible um, among the Arabs who uh, were under a, a, a vice regent, uh, a so-called phylaric. These were commanders uh, in the name of, Byzant of Byzantium or Eastern Rome, uh, responsible for the defenses of the borders of the Roman Empire against the Persians and the desert border uh, was therefore then the border where the nomadic Arabs were enrolled as allies of the Byzantines in order to help protect it and they were called the Rasanids and you have the spelling here the Rasanid Philarch uh, who was the leader of the Western Arabs um, uh, um, uh, the uh, 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 or one of them, this Jaffna al-Rasan, uh, actually tried to end this schism among these bishops so that this whole Trithiist episode would somehow be put aside or uh, overcome so that regular monophysitism would recur, uh, return uh, to, to the land. 
Uh, however, uh, Jaffna was no longer very powerful, and so uh, he failed then in his efforts to, to reconcile, and the schism continued, because by now, um, uh, power really had passed to other Arabs, uh, whom I describe as Eastern Arabs. And so let's go on. Let me quickly now show you on the map uh, where, uh, what we are talking about. Here is the center of the province of Arabia. That was where these Hassanids resided. But they governed, actually, this entire area, which we can call the Syrian steppe and desert. Let me show you now in the following um, uh, map uh, how far this Ghassanid um, uh, territory extended. You can see it quite a bit into the direction of Baghdad and Mesopotamia. And here now we will see the Ghassanid kingdom that uh, was a deputy to defend the eastern border of uh, uh, of Rome, uh, against now Eastern Arabs who uh, were deputed by the Persian king or king of kings, Shah Inja, uh, for the defense of Persia against Rome. And they were the Lachmids, whom you see here uh, as the adjacent territory. So in the 500s, the uh, Romans and the Persians had already gone to war against each other several times. Generally, the Romans were victorious, but usually the, Lahmid, the, um, uh, the Persians were able to come back. And of course, they used their, their vice regions, uh, those of the Hassanids and the, of the Lahmids, as uh, allies to fight the war for them in, in the desert here, in, the, in uh, the southern part of Syria. So here, roughly here. And so now a few words about the Lahmids. The Lahmids now were uh, the eastern, uh, uh, or part of the eastern Arabs, and uh, uh, in uh, the, the, uh, their, quote, king, or um, uh, the equivalent of Philarch in, uh, among the Rasanids, Rassan, uh, converted in 594 to Nestorian Christianity. Now, Nestorian Christianity is a Christian church. I mentioned this already briefly, that believes in the uh, two equal natures of uh, Jesus. So Jesus was equally human, so he was fully human, but he was also, of course, uh, God, because God, um, uh, in the interpretation of the uh, theology of the 500s, uh, was um, also Jesus, uh, in, in the sense that, uh, uh, in, in, in terms of Trinity and how it was represented, uh, he represented God coming to earth in order to bring salvation to humans. The, uh, by contrast, the, uh, the Monophysites believed in a primarily divine Jesus who took on the flesh of humans when he came to earth, but was, uh, let's say, three quarters divine, one quarter human. So we can see here that was a real contrast over which you could go to war and uh, could kill each other uh, if it came really to blows. And then on top of that, you had the schism within the schism uh, that there was somebody who stood up and said, and said, well, when we talk about Trinity, we have to talk about three different gods. So you can see the enormous amount of conflict that existed in Christianity. Now, he converted to Nestorianism, and then one of the sources says, once he had converted, that he chased the Jacobites from the provinces. So in other words, uh, only Nestorians now remained in the East, <coughs> among the Eastern Arabs. All the Jacobites, all the Monophysites now were pushed back into Ghassanid territory or even further uh, south into Egypt. And uh, now the Eastern Arabs uh, had established uh, their form of Christianity as dominant in the Eastern steppe. Now, unfortunately, however, um, uh, as it had so happened with the Ghassanids, but there it had happened already in 580, both the Roman uh, emperor and now also the Persian uh, king in uh, uh, the early 600s, decided that uh, these uh, uh, vice regents in the desert, uh, who were the commanders of the Arabs to fight this uh, supplementary war, so to speak, between the Romans and the Persians, that they were expendable. They had maybe grown a little too strong for their, uh, uh, for their appointed positions. And so, I mentioned already, the Ghassanids had been reduced uh, around 580. Now, the Persian king went a step further. He had his king, uh, who was supposed to defend the border against uh, uh, the, the Romans, uh, assassinated outright. And so that was the end of the eastern um, 
uh, uh, Arabs in the city of Hira, which is on the, east, uh, on the western uh, fringes of the uh, uh, Persian Empire. And uh, as, I, uh, uh, as I'm uh, saying here now in the next um, um, uh, uh, outline, uh, or will now in a moment, uh, the uh, now leaderless, the Eastern um, uh, uh, Christians, uh, Eastern Arabs, uh, dispersed into the desert, but they became then powerful. So that's the dynamic, so to speak, of uh, Eastern versus uh, Western Arabs right around 602. And that's an important point of departure into which we will go then in a moment. Uh, the uh, Yeah, as it so happened, however, just a few months after uh, the Persian Shah had decided to murder his uh, vice regent in the desert, um, a usurper in Constantinople overthrew the Roman emperor. And uh, Phocas, the uh, usurper uh, emperor, uh, then uh, was, the, uh, uh, was a, a usurper against whom the Shah and Shah, Hosrow II, of the Persians went to war because he wanted to avenge the overthrow of the previous emperor uh, for the reason that uh, he, uh, Hosro, had been helped already a few years earlier uh, by the uh, Roman emperor to regain his throne. There was a brief revolt in, uh, in Persia. The Romans and the Persians always had hostility against each other, but there were also periods of peace, and so they, they intermarried, and so on. And so it was not surprising that Khosrow declared himself now the uh, avenger of uh, the murdered um, uh, Roman uh, uh, emperor and went to war against the, the, the usurper. Um, of course, now he lacked a uh, representative in the desert because uh, just a few months earlier, uh, the Eastern Arabs had, uh, after the murder of their, uh, of their king, had dispersed into the desert. And so there was not much that he could do now uh, as far as uh, uh, the desert uh, zone in, in terms of the war of the Persians against the Romans was concerned. Now the war, well known, no need now to go into the details, we, uh, moved back and forth. At one point, the Persians... Uh, uh, um, uh, conquered almost all of the Roman Empire. They went as far as Egypt. But then the war turned around miraculously under a new uh, emperor, Heraclius, who then turned, uh, the entire, uh, turned the tables and turned the entire situation around and eventually in 628 uh, actually even advanced against the capital of the Persians. So that was the end then of Khosro and uh, the end also of uh, the, the Persian Empire because there was no clear successor. In that particular situation now, uh, because uh, um, uh, the Arabs were among themselves in a way throughout this war period, 602 to 628, because on neither side were they needed or wanted, they were among themselves. So that's the important uh, consideration uh, that we have to think of now. Um, with the idea that the Eastern Arabs were a bit stronger than the Western Arabs, but both were now in the uh, Syrian desert and watched from afar how the biggies were killing each other, so to speak, the two empires. And uh, in, uh, then in 622, uh, right when the war was beginning to turn in favor of the, uh, uh, of the Eastern Romans, they declared an Arab kingdom, 622. This is very important that this uh, Arab kingdom was declared at that particular time because actually from the Islamic tradition, so that the sources that are dated 200 years after the emergence of uh, the, the early Muslims, uh, 622 is which date? The date of the Hijra, the emigration of Muhammad from Mecca to Medina, and uh, in Medina, then, uh, the organization of the early Islamic community according to the Islamic tradition. Well, now, in the Christian sources of the period, 622 is the date of the declaration of the Arab kingdom. And accordingly, then, those uh, Christian chroniclers of the period always then talked about what uh, then happened with this Arab kingdom. So let's, uh, so let's uh, get, then, to uh, the this dark moment, so to speak, in the Syrian desert. 
We know that Eastern Arabs dispersed, made themselves dominant, so probably the Western uh, Arabs uh, were subservient, or at least they were being battled against, or maybe there were conflicts, or maybe there was also gradually emerging of the two. We don't know. So that would be pure speculation, and as a good historian, I'm not doing uh, that particular thing. I merely, for, uh, for purposes of illustration, I want to show you, yes, there is a connection here between the Islamic sources of 200 years later and what the Christian chroniclers of the 600 say, only it's being described a little differently. Uh, instead of a hijra, uh, of, of, a, uh, of a prophet by the name of Muhammad migrating from Mecca to Medina, we are talking about an Arab kingdom emerging. And uh, uh, right from the start, these, uh, uh, this Arab kingdom, according to one uh, Christian chronicler, uh, consisted of two leaders and two sides. And this is the, uh, perhaps the most important source here for uh, the understanding of the beginning of Islam because we are talking about probably uh, uh, Western Christianized Arabs forming one side, Eastern Christian Arabs forming another side, and each had a leader. That corresponds to when Muhammad was in Medina with his efforts of, uh, um, uh, of uh, Muhammad's to return to Mecca and to convert Mecca from polytheism to uh, monotheism, and of course the Meccans resisted, and uh, eventually their resistance was worn down. Two sides and two leaders, because of course, when Muhammad was in Medina, there was a leader of the so-called pagan Arabs in Mecca, Abu Sufyan, uh, who represented the other side. So, uh, if this is indeed true, then the Quran is actually very helpful. I mentioned a little earlier, we now know that the Quran is truly um, uh, uh, dates truly to the 600s, in which way it came about. That is still very mysterious. Um, we, uh, from what I am saying here, we have to assume that it um, came together as a scripture between 602 and sometimes toward the end of the 600s. And when I say 602, that's of course the time when the Eastern Christian Arabs dispersed in the Syrian desert. Note, by the way, that I'm not saying any, anything about Mecca and Medina. I'm, see, I'm merely talking about the Eastern and Western Christ, uh, Arab Christians in the Syrian desert, wherever they were. Now, uh, that gets us then to the Quran, which is a re reliable source now for our further investigation. And that is, um, there is a curious term, mushrikun, that appears about 19 times in the Quran. And... Uh, is usually translated as pagans and polytheists. But in 1999, Jared Hotting uh, published a very important book. Hotting is also among those who contextualize and seek to understand uh, the beginnings of Islam in a wider context. And he determined that these mushrikun were actually Christians. But that's where the book ends. And we have to go much farther than those Christians. And so therefore, um, uh, I uh, wanted to include here now a few verses that give us an idea here how much further we can go. Indeed, those who have belie believed and those who were Jews and Sa uh, Sabians and the Christians, Nasara and the Majans, and those who associate the uh, uh, or Ashraku, so these are the Mushrikun, Allah will judge between them on the day of resurrection. Indeed, Allah is over all things. And uh, um, uh, uh, that's this particular Quranic verse. Now, there, is, uh, there was an Astorian metropolitan who uh, lived um, a, a bit later uh, and who can be related to that particular Quranic verse because uh, in his writing, um, uh, which is accessible through the Maja his uh, composition Majalis, he says the following. As for the monotheists, to whose monotheism the Quran testifies, whom we recognize to be confessing that God is one, um, they are, um, uh, they, um, that God is one, they are uh, as we ourselves, sorry, uh, that is the Nestorians, the Jacobites, and the Melkites. The Melkites are the Chalcedonians, and that is a, p a particular term that uh, was being used at that uh, time for the uh, imperial Christians, meaning uh, those under the king. Um, so, um, uh, and, and, and those of the Christians who follow our way. As for the polytheists, the Mushrikun among them, they are the people who imitate Christianity, like the Marcionites, the Dysonites, the Manichaeans, and the Tritheists, 
And there you also have the Arabic term. Um, those who posit three and others who trace their origins to Christianity but who are devoid of Christianity and far removed from it. So in other words, the Trithiists are Christian heresy from the point of view of the Nestorians. And uh, they are other Christians who are pretending to be Christians, but they are not truly Jacobite, Malachite, or Nestorian. Now, um, uh, just so that you know that uh, uh, when he use, when um, uh, uh, Shinaya uses the, the term Trithius at Trinurthia, uh, he means that and not the term that uh, already in the fifth century was available among Arabs in Arabic, uh, the, uh, 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 the term Trinity, Thaluth, uh, is, uh, would be the Arabic. That term is not being used, and so therefore this uh, testimony by Shania is so important. Um, so let me now show you uh, what then the Quran has to say about these trithias. O people of the scripture, do not commit excess in your religion or say about Allah except the truth. The Messiah Jesus, the son of Mary, was but a messenger of Allah, and his word which he directed to Mary and a soul created a at a command, so that's the immaculate conception, of course, of, uh, of Jesus uh, um, uh, from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers and do not say three. Desist, it is better for you, etc. Uh, in other words, they have certainly disbelieved who say Allah is the third of three. So neither of these verses speaks of Trinity, but just of three. Uh, therefore then... Um, uh, and uh, here I'm saying that uh, the, the term Trinity does not appear. So we can assume, uh, coming now to the conclusion, that what the Quran says in, uh, in its own testimony about these Trithias who emerged in the 500s and caused this split among the Jacobites or the Monophysites, that was a particular predominant form of Christianity among the the Western Arabs, whether they were the majority or whether Monophysites in general, so those that did not split up, uh, split from uh, the, the uh, uh, run of the mill Monophysitism that uh, Severus had created, but belonged to the smaller and more uh, specific Trithias sect, we do not know. Uh, probably the assumption would be that the majority were Monophysite of the Western uh, Arabs, but there was a minority, and these were clearly uh, the ones against which the Quran polemicizes. And that's very important because the Quran is actually very friendly towards both uh, Jacobism, Monophysitism, and Nestorianism. And in fact, uh, in many ways, comes out uh, of, of Nestorianism. So uh, uh, um, it denies, uh, that is very expressed uh, in the Quran, that Jesus is the son of God. Instead, he's always the servant um, or the, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, like all other prophets uh, of, of God. Um, but as I uh, uh, try to emphasize here throughout uh, my, my presentation, uh, first of all, these Mushikun were not pagans. They were Christians. They were either uh, Western uh, Jacobite or Eastern Nestorian, and they are generally being treated very gently in the Quran because they are verses of convergence. So in other words, uh, we here in the Quran always want to emphasize, uh, emphasize what we have common with mainstream Christianity, be it uh, Monophysite or uh, Nestorian. Yes, there are then also verses of divergence, particularly those that emphasize uh, the um, uh, the uh, um, uh, servantship uh, of Jesus, but then um, uh, uh, for the rest of the Quran, if you read it very carefully, you uh, come you come across Mary's immaculate conception. So Mary conceived Jesus through the spirit, through the word of God, also the Spirit. Uh, this is a variation that is a little more complicated, but can also be explained. So. Mainstream Christianity, that's for how uh, all Christians interpreted uh, the, the, the Gospels. Uh, that even though Jesus, uh, uh, Joseph was the father, uh, uh, the conception of Jesus was actually through the word of God. Um, Jesus has mir uh, miracle powers. Uh, that's uh, emphasized throughout all of the verses that appear in the Quran about Jesus. Uh, 
And Jesus, um, if you read carefully, also dies on the cross and is, is resurrected, even though those verses just intimated. I mean, you cannot really interpret it, but and clearly some work has uh, uh, took place there to take that away from Jesus. But um, uh, the ascension is directly expressed. Um, uh, Jesus rose to the right of the Heavenly Father. So, um, uh, my, uh, one of my conclusions then is, uh, this particular attitude that the Quran has toward Christianity as a whole, as opposed to tritheists, who are the real bad guys, so to speak, of the Quran, the ones who uh, talk about the three gods of Trinity, uh, a regular, uh, either a Monophysite or um, a Melkite or Nestorian Christianity, uh, is being uh, treated in a very friendly way, but always with the view that Jesus was actually the one who announced someone who would come after him. him. Uh, if you go to John, there are these famous verses uh, on, on the paraclete, uh, which uh, in the Quran and later in the Islamic tradition are being interpreted as Yes, there uh, Jesus announced someone who would come thereafter, and that is Muhammad. Muhammad is actually not really a name. It's, uh, it literally means the praised one, and is probably, therefore then, uh, the uh, notation, so to speak, for that particular sage, scribe, or other person who worked on the various parts that eventually came together and made up the Quran, the, Holy, the, the scripture of the, of the Muslims. Um, uh, uh, participating in a collective scholarly reworking, so to speak, of all Christian traditions in order to come up with this notion that Muhammad is really the last prophet and not Jesus. With that, uh, I thank you for listening to me, and uh, I will be happy also to engage you in the uh, discussion. All right. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Professor Von Sivers. Uh, we do have about 12 minutes for questions. We're going to be finishing up at 4. Uh, if you need to leave before the Q&A, you're welcome to do that. Uh, for those who would like to stay, uh, Professor Von Sivers has graciously agreed to take some questions. What I'd ask you to do if you have a question is just to raise your hand. I will bring you this mic. Uh, please introduce yourself, your name, and your major, um, and then uh, you can raise uh, your question. So, uh, question right here. Yes. And again, we'll go until 4 p.m. So, uh, in the Quran, it says that... Oh, sorry. My name is Mariah Dean. Um, I, my major is history. I'm from Brazil. But I, um, I was thinking that in the Quran, it says that Jesus, like the Mary, uh, Jesus was conceived by, like, God's... The, the word. Yeah. The word. Okay. So, how do they explain that God is not the father of Jesus? Like who is the father of Jesus for them? Yeah, um, uh, for, for, uh, for understanding Christianity, Judaism for that matter as well, uh, and Islam, you have to be aware that one of the cardinal points of um, all of the debates that were of, uh, often, of course, quite bloody, as I mentioned, uh, for all of the de uh, these debates, it was always very important that God, uh, the Father, uh, let's put this in parenthesis for a moment, is transcendent. Um, transcendence means you can say nothing about him. Um, he is simply removed from anything sensory. So uh, even though he reveals himself, uh, there is nothing you can say about him, and that has to be protected. So theologians always had to be very careful when they said G uh, when they argued. Uh, that Jesus, uh, that uh, God uh, had a son in Trinity, uh, because how is that possible uh, that the son, son now, who is God, comes to earth and has this double nature, so to speak, because doesn't that drag the transcendent God into imminence and uh, um, make him dirty, so to speak? I mean, make him part of this corrupt world, because that was, of course, always the assumption uh, uh, behind, all, uh, behind this. Uh, this effort to protect the transcendence of God uh, uh, sort of resurfaced in the formation of Islam. And so therefore then the strict denial that God uh, can engender sons. Uh, 
Uh, but also now, and when you look at the vocabulary, uh, voila uh, means a carnal son, even is much more abstract. Uh, uh, the, uh, that word, in, uh, which means son, of course, in Arabic, voila means child. Um, that could mean that, um, uh, well, it might be even co compatible with this abd, with this uh, servant uh, function. So in other words, um, the, the concern uh, to protect the trans transcendence of God on one hand, but also to fully explain uh, uh, Jesus Christ, after all, in the Gospels, he comes across as a person with one nature, one character, one a number of traits that you can describe very well, and you can preach, of course, every Sunday on various aspects of, of uh, the life of Jesus, uh, that he nevertheless was divine. Well, um, uh, uh, that was precisely then the problem where everybody uh, diverged. Uh, did I come anywhere close to, uh, uh, to you with my answer? Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, my name is George Garcia. I'm studying international relations with a focus on Latin America. But I have been thinking a lot about how religion is taught in public, er, in public educa education, especially in K through 12. And I was wondering, I know this isn't exactly your field or what you're studying, but what would you say is the best way to teach Islam in a way that wouldn't offend or scare off Christians or make them feel threatened about the religion, if that makes sense? Or the other way around. How can you uh, uh, sit down with a fundamentalist or reformist uh, Muslim and uh, explain Christianity to, to this person? Uh, I'm very grateful that you raised this point because you can, uh, of course, uh, ask yourself, okay, now you have heard a more or less learned presentation here about the, uh, the uh, uh, conflicts among the Christians and the 500s. What, what's the relevance of all of this? What do you take away from that, uh, apart from this being just, well, I hope, solid scholarship? Uh, there is a point, and that is, uh, remember I mentioned this idea here of convergence? So in other words, if you know about these Christian roots that Islam has, Islam did not uh, emerge sui generis, uh, out of the revelations that Muhammad received uh, on a mountain near Mecca, which incidentally is called Hera. So they <laughs> see uh, a remembrance of this particular term because that's, of course, the name of the Eastern Arab Christian city of Hera in, in Mesopotamia. Anyway, uh, it's of immediate relevance because if you uh, emphasize to Muslims, uh, look, um, if you are willing, um, I will lead you to an understanding of the Quran, but forget for a moment the tradition that, is, uh, that was formulated 200 years later. Okay? I mean, we know about Muhammad, for example, only because a biography was written 200 years later. The word Muhammad appears only three times as such as Muhammad. Uh, in, uh, in the Quran. So we do not even know who revealed the Quran. Um, for all we know is that uh, what we talk about at the, as the revelation of the Quran was the communal work of scribes who were deeply steeped in all of the scriptures of Christianity, including also all non-canonical non uh, non ones uh, of, of previous centuries and uh, uh, put together what we can maybe call a concordance of all of the Christian writings. This is the original meaning of Islam, by the way. So the whole point here is, if it is possible to, say, so let me first answer the question of uh, you and me sitting down with a, uh, a Salafi or even jihadi Muslim. I mean, jihadi just before he engages in jihad, obviously. Uh, Muslim, and uh, you can somehow sit down and uh, be patient with each other, then uh, you and I would say, look now, there are Christian roots, and uh, these roots furthermore are, uh, appear in the Quran uh, in most co uh, mostly convergent form, so that um, there is actually a lot of communality between Christianity and Islam, and uh, if you are willing, then uh, we count you, Muslims, among those who inherited the common concordance heritage of Judaism 
and Christianity, even though Christianity within itself was of course deeply con conflicted, as I pointed out. Um, so we are heirs of all three things. And so the Muslim, uh, the Islamic Quranic revelation is therefore just another version of the uh, revelatory uh, tradition that comes out of the Middle East. Now, let's uh, turn it also around, of course, uh, since the, you originally asked the question uh, from the other side. Um, uh, and that is, um, uh, how, can, how can we, uh, uh, could you reformulate it so that I can be precise with my, with my answer? How could we, how do I want to put this? How could we help Christians see the humanity in Islam yeah. without like, threatening their own sense of identity in Christianity? Yeah. So uh, that would be then uh, we among ourselves with, is any Muslim present? I, um, I looked around earlier and uh, didn't think there was one. Um, but I mean, obviously, I'm not saying anything offensive, but I'm, I merely want to be very sensitive in, in my answer. Uh, and that is, um, uh, we among ourselves should uh, draw away from the multiple prejudices that we have about Islam. And uh, they are, of course, countless. Um, I'm not even mentioning now the ones that, are the, that uh, populated the Middle Ages. Uh, I'm talking only about, let's say, contemporary ones. And um, uh, among these prejudices uh, are, number one, these Orientalists who peel these uh, uh, onion peels away uh, think that uh, Islam and the rise of Islam uh, has to be explained primarily out of these Islamic sources. But that has run its course now. We cannot use the Islamic tradition anymore. Um, let me give you the example. The, the Muhammad biography, the so-called Sira, S-I-R-A, it was composed in uh, uh, eight, uh, or the, the final version in 823. So you see uh, the 200 years that I was talking about. There is for, uh, that is for the first time the source where we then uh, learn about Muhammad was born in 570, he grew up in Mecca, he had his first revelations in 610, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, among ourselves, if we uh, open ourselves to what the Christians had to say about the rise of Islam in the 600s, like I did here in my presentation, uh, then we would come to the conclusion, well, uh, the origins of Islam can be um, nicely compared to what Christianity was all about in the 500s and all of the problems that it uh, experienced. You see them uh, continued here in the origins of Islam. This will open, up, uh, open us up to a view of late antiquity that is much larger than just these few years of the early 600s when between 610 when the first revelations came and 632 when the Prophet Muhammad, according to Islamic tradition, died. Um, which is a very narrow focus on uh, the origins of Islam. So, of course, you can retell the story of, of Muhammad a thousand times, and I do this actually in my uh, uh, history survey classes. Uh, but then, of course, uh, a week later I say, okay, what you have just now learned is not history, but religion, okay? The religious interpretation of what, uh, uh, how Muslims viewed the, the rise of Islam. Now, let me tell you what the Christians had to say when uh, uh, these origins of Islam occurred. So in short, um, if you uh, give up this Orientalist approach, this notion that through philology you can clarify these Islamic sources and through all of these traditions that are biased and uh, have certain religious points of views, you can come to some sort of historical background or, or origin, uh, it won't work. Uh, what will work, however, uh, is a historical context that you establish where you have then um, uh, a much, much better knowledge cert uh, certainly of uh, Christianity in late antiquity and particularly these curious people called Trithias who usually, by the way, Orientalists dismiss them as just minor people who uh, uh, were discussing a refinement of uh, theological approaches to the problems of Christ Christology and theology. Ah, uh, these, uh, these were people over which, first of all, these were doctrines over which people killed each other, number one, as Jenkins said. But then furthermore, uh, this was a real widespread among monks of Syria, where Islam probably originated, 
uh, monks of, of Syria, um, where um, lots of monks were Trithias, and where probably lots of Arabs were Trithias. Otherwise, why would there be this uh, battle against the Mushrikun, who were the alleged um, uh, associators? So in short, what I'm saying is, um, uh, taking the traditional Orientalist approach, um, uh, talking now only among ourselves, not, not, not Muslims, although Muslims, in a way, are, uh, should, should listen in, so to speak. Um, uh, as, uh, as people who take in uh, what happened in the, uh, uh, among Christians in the 500s, we are taking this much wider contextual approach of, well, that's what happened in Christianity, and that had such and such effects on the Arabs who were in this border region between the two empires and who were exposed already to the full blast of all of these different Christianities and who worked out this conflict among themselves, you see. That's the important point. Because, of course, uh, the, the big uh, Christian church uh, then subsequently, I, I assume the, uh, we all know this, of course, there is still today the Coptic church of Egypt that is monophysitic. There are monophysite Christians in Egypt are very defensive against Catholicism, against uh, Greek Orthodoxy. Greek Orthodoxy, Catholicism, Protestantism, and then further 19th century developments, including then also Mormonism. Uh, they all follow uh, this Chalcedonian tradition about which I didn't say much. And then there are the Nestorians who are the ne neglected Christians. They are actually the Christians who then uh, when eventually the Romans, dis uh, sorry, when the Muslims destroyed the, uh, the, the Persian Empire, um, uh, uh, were represented all along the so-called Silk Road. So Christians today in China are very likely to be Nestorians. So the Nestorian community is very small. Uh, it has suffered tremendously under the ISIS uh, um, uh, uh, takeover of parts of Iraq because... Um, uh, I, uh, the the um, representatives of ISIS were very anti-Christian, and the predominant number of Christians in uh, in Iraq are the Nestorians, or the descendants of the Nestorians, the so-called Eastern uh, Church. So, uh, what I'm saying here is um, uh, the the larger perspective that I'm recommending uh, gives us a much better understanding of what Islam is all about. Thank you very much. Uh, if you could join me once again in thanking Professor Ron Sivers uh, for his visit, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you.